morning. Welcome to Elmira Baptist Church Sunday School. This is uh, February 7th, 2021. We're continuing our study in reciprocal living. Reciprocal living is the study of the one another commands. And that's the commands that really describe our fellowship in the body of Christ. What God wants us to do, what was written in the New Testament to describe how we should act to and toward each other, uh, implying a reciprocal nature, what I do for you, you do for me, and a, a, uh, a mutual responsibility to serve Christ by serving one another in the church. And this week, we are going to study forbear one another. And I know you just probably said, what is forbear? Well, I thought I knew what it was, and I think uh, I was pretty close, but as I looked at this, I saw, ooh, there's a lot to this. And so we're going to talk about forbearing and what that is uh, this morning. This is our 19th command and our 21st lesson. And I wanted to mention to you that you can go back at any time and look at the previous lessons because these are recorded. My favorite place is Sermon Audio to go and look at them, sermonaudio.com. They even have an app for the phones that you can go back and you look at, look for Reciprocal Living or look for Scotty Sanderson or look for series of messages. You can find it any of those ways once you find Elmira Baptist Church, California, and you're able to go back and look at some of those. So if you wanted to go back and look at what was involved in the introductory lessons of Reciprocal Living or Fellowship, we looked at three different aspects of fellowship you can go back and do that at any time, and you don't have to. You can watch as little or as much as you want, and you stop at any time. Uh, I wanted to share that with you. Also, as I like to say, I think it's important. We have a two and a half page handout, which may be uh, front and back and another page. And uh, I would like you to use a handout if you can, because it truly enhances and enables your ability to absorb the material. Because I speak fast. And there's a lot of material, and you're not right here where I can see you. You're there, but I can't see you. And um, so I want to make sure that you are able to follow along. We have uh, introduction, a com uh, the command. There are two different places in the scripture where it gives a command. Comment, and there's a long comment section. Then definition, biblical example, principles, and then what is the importance of this command? So if you're here in Sunday school, there should be one available, either back in the foyer or an usher or sitting off uh, and nearby on a chair where people can get them. Um, if you don't have one and you can't find one, ask someone where they are. If you're streaming from home and you would like this and you're not receiving it, please contact the church office. I would love for you to have this handout. I spend a lot of time putting about 90% of what I say down on paper so that you have it. There's no mystery. It's all written out. Um, we want to, I want to also make sure I warmly welcome everybody in Sunday School and welcome to everyone who is uh, watching this by streaming. Thank you. I want to give a little credit to Roy who has been, uh, uh, been the camera person and operating all of the the uh, equipment to make sure that this gets across to you. Thank you, Roy, for that for that effort. Uh, let us pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together as we study his word. Father, it is indeed a privilege to share your word with each other. I pray, Father, uh, we know that we looked at that command to teach one another. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning as we look at your word <coughs> regarding forbear. We recognize this is kind of a difficult thing to do because often we're called on to do it when there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of trouble. We pray, Father, that you would help us as we look to this, look at this command to f find the truth that you would have us to act upon and that you would help us to act upon it. Help us, Father, to be concerned with the love and unity in our church. Help us to forbear one another and uh, using love and forgiveness. 
We pray, Father, that you would be with us this morning and help us to honor you as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we have three items in the uh, introduction. Uh, the first is uh, three questions, actually. Were the Christians in the early first century church more spiritual than us? Now, that's a good question. You would think they might be more spiritual because they were closer to the apostles and the original doctrine that the apostles taught and that they had the fresh letters in many cases from some of the apostles and disciples that had uh, written, uh, the elders and bishops that had written to them. Um, so we'll see. Number two, what was their need? What was the first century church? What is one of their needs? And then number three, what is our need today? So as we look at this, um, I think it's important to recognize, number one, where the Christians in the first century church were more spiritual than us. In the early church, there were people from all walks of life. You think of that Greeks and Romans and slave and free and uh, people with different opinions, people with different ethnic backgrounds, different ways of doing things, different ways of thinking, different degrees of maturity in the faith. And some of the people were slow to put the old ways to death and slow to put on the new man, the new nature. And some were proud of their accomplishments and spirituality. And some were critical, some were envious, some were contentious. There were some people with distracting habits and mannerisms and some with irritable tempers. In other words, there were people who were not perfect, who were not free from faults, even though there were people, um, they were not free from, they, were, they had distracting habits and mannerisms and some with irritable tempers. In other words, there were people that were not perfect and they were not free from faults, even though many were dedicated believers. They had issues that God was working with them on. And so as I look at those people and as I think about that, to answer the question, were the Christians in the early first century church more spiritual? My answer is no. They were people like we were. They, they had the advantage of having, in many cases, some of the living apostles minister to them and having their churches started by the apostles, but they struggled as we do. And so what was their need? For the early church, Paul stated that believers must forbear one another. They were all in the same imperfect condition. They all needed to walk more and more in accordance with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to see from our command what he wanted them, what was their need? Number two, to forbear and to forgive. Why? To preserve love and unity. We're going to look at that. So they had a need to forbear. We're going to define that in a minute. Forbear and forgive one another to preserve their unity. So what's our need today? Well, the church today is in the same condition. People are still people. Christians still find it difficult to let go of the old, the old habits, the old ways, and the old practices, and, and to put those to death. And Paul's guidance is still valid. It's still good. So let's find out what Paul meant when he said that believers should forbear one another. So our need is the same as the first century Christians. Now, I want to share a, uh, a quote with you. Now, I think I've heard that from, from this pulpit. Uh, when pastors share this. Um, and it's a poem. And it goes like this. To live above with the saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know. Well, that's another story. So indicative in that poem is we are all blemished. We have things that are not what they ought to be in our lives, and that makes us sometimes a little rough around the edges, some of us more than others. <laughs> Speaking of myself, some of us more than others. So we need to uh, recognize that we have blemishes and that, that we are working on, and that we need to 
uh, work to uh, forbear with one another while we're working on our own issues. So let's look at the command. The command is from Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, and Colossians 3, 12 through 14. That's in your handout. Now, not the scripture, but just the reference. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. I think it's interesting. I want to stop just a second. Paul was in prison when he wrote this uh, epistle to the Ephesians and also the other reference in Colossians. He was in prison. To the Ephesians, he said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Uh, I think that he did that to get their attention. Uh, and establish how much he has suffered for Christ. He's a prisoner. He's in prison for the Lord. And uh, he says, I therefore beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in the Colossians passage, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And verse 14 of Colossians 3. And above all these things put on charity, which is love. The bond of perfectness or completeness or maturity. So we have our two passages here. Now the word forbear is uh, the word, and it's in your handout. <clears throat> third bullet under command. The word for uh, is uh, anek omai. And it's from the word, from two words, meaning to hold and up. To hold up, and, and I have, you see in the parenthesis, as in holding back. To hold you up, as in holding you back. And it's used as a verb. This word is a verb. And it means to, it's an action word. It means to bear with, endure, or put up with. Now I'm going to share with you um, a reference that I found uh, about this word. Um, and I don't have an attribution. I just found it in a passage that I was reading where they uh, referred to uh, some lexicon, so it's unknown. Uh, bearing with uh, is the word anekomai, and it's related to the noun called an ok a, and that's spelled, that's not in your handout, that's the noun, and it's spelled. A N O C H E. It looks like a nochi, but it's anake, an anake. And in classical Greek, I don't want you to put off, be put off by the words. I just like to give those for those that want to know. But I want, want to concentrate on the meaning. In the classical Greek, the noun anake, anake is used of holding back or stopping of hostilities, a truce. This is a word that's used for a truce, often in the glass, classical Greek. And it, it means to make allowance for each other's faults, or simply stated, to put up with each other. The verb, anekome, an, um, means to be patient with in the sense of enduring possible difficulty. It means to endure, to hold out, in spite of persecution, threats, injury, indifference, complaints, and not retaliate. I thought that was the best uh, quick explanation I could find. Um, comment. Now, this section I've, I've come to start using this is, let's take a look, let's analyze and look at the command here. Um, this one another command is different from all the others that we've looked at from this perspective. <coughs> they call it in the study, an indirect command. Instead of saying Ephesians or Colossians, <clears throat> forbear one another, and I'm reading right under the word comment in the first bullet. Instead of saying forbear one another, Paul writes to the Ephesians, walk worthy of the vocation 
which you are called with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, comma, forbearing one another in love. So he's added it later. He takes the verb forbear, adds ing, and that describes how we are to walk worthy by forbearing one another, considering all those things, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, all of those things. Now he does that in Colossians as well. And both of them, he adds that phrase at the end, forbearing one another. Okay, so it's, an end, it's no less a command, no less important, but it's forbearing one another. For those of you grammar people, it's uh, a participial phrase. Okay. <laughs> there are very few grammar people anymore. Okay, the direct commands are, let's look at the third, second bullet. The direct commands are in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Walk worthy of the vocation to which you are called. That's the command. That's the direct command. And in Colossians 3, 12 through 14, put on, and then there's a phrase, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now, I want to, I found a day, our daily bread, which is often very helpful, uh, those quotes, because they'll take a subject and kind of drill down to the importance of them. This was actually written May 19, 1997, Dressed for Success. Paul says, put on, and that's just like putting on clothes. The imagery there is to put on these clothes. So this was written by D.C. McCaslin, uh, who I don't know. I know. He said, and, and he, he wrote this, Our Daily Bread, which reads, in 1975, John Malloy, the author, wrote a book called Dress for Success, which became the fashion guidebook for many people trying to climb the corporate ladder, get it advanced themselves in a company Malloy's advice centered on a basic premise, always dress like your boss. Every day for work, school, or recreation, we all have to decide what we are to wear. And even in the dress down 90s, in the time in which this was written, people strive for the right look at work. But we also must make choices about another wardrobe our attitude and actions. If we claim to be the followers of Christ, our spiritual apparel is of far greater significance than our physical clothing. Now, let's take a look at God's dress code for us. As his chosen people, we are to clothe ourselves with kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Remember those list of character qualities in the, in, that are listed in those passages. That's from Colossians 3.12. We are to demonstrate patience and forgiveness. And above all, we must put on love, which is the bond of perfection or completion or maturity in verse 14 of chapter 3. Now, um, he, got, he has a series of questions here. Do I begin each day by acknowledging Christ as a person in charge, the one for whom I work? Talks about always dress like your boss. We should be putting on those qualities to dress like the Lord Jesus Christ, to be like him. We're to be imitators of Christ. So he says, Mr. McCaslin says, do I begin each day by acknowledging Christ as a person in charge, the one for whom I work? Do I take time to clothe myself with attitudes that please him? Am I wearing what people are most longing to see? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. If so, I'll be dressed for success in God's service. And signed D.C. D. McCaslin. So there's a poem. You know, these things often have a poem, and then there's going to be a quote after that. So the, the poem is, Oh, to be like him, tender and kind, gentle in spirit, lowly in mind, more like Jesus day after day, filled with the spirit now and always. And the quote is, this is good. I really liked this. Kindness is Christianity, 
with its working clothes on. I like that. Kindness is Christianity with its working clothes on. Remember, we're to put on kindness. Now, um, we are in, uh, we, we looked at the direct commands, and now we're going to look at the way forbearing is used in the third bullet under comment section. Next bullet from the bottom of page one. Forbearing in both these passages, I want to emphasize this. Uh, they used to have a thing in the military where, where the, the instructor, if he was going to give you an answer to a question on the test, he would go, this is important. Sometimes he wouldn't even say that. And you would just know, okay, well, I need to write that down. This is important, okay? Forbearing in both these passages powerfully describes how or with what attitude we are to walk worthy and put on these qualities. It's as if, and I'm reading right from bullet number three under comment, it's as if we, he rather, Paul, were saying, Ephesians and Colossians, walk worthy and put on any, those qualities. And while at the same time you're doing that, remember to make sure that you forbear one another. And not in the handout, remember to use these qualities to forbear one another because you draw upon those strength of those qualities to do that. And that leads us to the last bullet. In both passages, forbearing one another, and this is really important, forbearing one another is evidence of the qualities mentioned in these verses. It's, in other words, reading right from that last bullet on the bottom of the page, in other words, forbearing love, we're to forbear one another in love. A forbearing love is a reflection of Christ's qualities and his image and a direct result of compassion and humility, kindness and patience, and certainly of love. In other words, when we forbear one another, we're employing these qualities, we're using these qualities, we're drawing upon these qualities, we are guided by these qualities. These aspects of our character that Christ wants us to have and that Paul commanded us to have uh, through the Ephesians and Colossians passage by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we compassionately and humbly and kindly and patiently are to forbear one another lovingly and forgiving one another. So forgiving one another is evidence of these qualities in our lives and forbear forbearing love is a reflection and it's a direct result of compassion, humility, kindness, and patience. Now, I have a quote by Spurgeon. He says, I love this because he really draws on this imagery of putting on these qualities like putting on garments. C.H. Spurgeon says, this is what you got to wear even on the outside. To put it on, not to have a latent, that means a, kind of something below the surface, a residual kindness in your heart, and a, and a degree of humbleness somewhere down deep in your soul if you could get at it. But you are to put it on. It's to be the very clothes that you wear. These are the sacred vestments of your daily priesthood. Put them on. Amen. That, that is eloquent. No wonder he was called the Prince of Preachers. You know, the priest had a garment that he put on that had incredible amount of significance by symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel, the stones that were there, the breastplate, the, the linen ephod, all of the garments that were there, the, 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 the hat that he had, the mitre. It was all representative of something. We are to put on our sacred vestments, our sacred clothing, for our daily. We are a kingdom of priests. We all represent Christ to one another and to others. And we are to put on those sacred vestments of our daily priesthood. Put them on, he says. Let's look at uh, the next page two. Let's look at the definition. 
So what is the definition of forbearing one another? Now, I didn't break this down, so we have a long sentence, but I think it'll be easy to understand. Forbearing one another is graciously enduring and putting up with the faults and the weaknesses, as well as the displeasing and offensive attitudes and actions of others. It includes an idea of holding back a response and a reaction because of or out of love and unity, while showing kindness, compassion, humility, meekness, and patience. So looking at that again, forbearing one another is graciously enduring. How much did the Lord graciously endure with us before he saved us? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord put up a lot for many of us before we accepted Christ as our Savior. So the Lord graciously endured us. We need to graciously endure and put up with the faults and weaknesses, as well as, the, and even after we're saved, as well as the displeasing and offensive attitudes and actions of others. It includes the idea of not reacting suddenly in anger, but holding back a response and a reaction that might be wrong out of love and unity while showing kindness, compassion, humility, meekness, and patience. For many years, I looked at these qualities that the Lord wants us to cultivate. Character, we call it character. I, things that we develop, qualities that we develop in us that makes us like Christ. And really, only the Holy Spirit can do that. And very, I, I've just been truly intrigued by how different our lives can be when we, guide, we are guided by the Holy Spirit and he uses these qualities of Christ-like character in our own lives to make ourselves like him. Let's look at a couple of them. I want to look at humility and the... This is an anonymous quote. I wish I had the name of the person who wrote it because I think it's, it's an incredible quote. Uh, this quote says, forbearing with others grows out of humility. And you go, well, how does that work? Um, and the quote goes, if we don't recognize our own sins and failures before God, then we feel we need to take our own revenge and make sure others get what they deserve and judge them and make a decision about what they deserve. Or he goes on to say, retaliate in kind. Forbear means to hold up, to hold oneself, to be firm, to sustain or bear, to endure. It suggests sustaining whatever comes at you and holding back self from reacting to it. Our sins have been forgiven. From that perspective, God has been gracious with us. We need to lovingly forbear the offenses of others and not retaliate and react to others. And <clears throat> that is hard to do. You want to do something hard? That is hard. Um, like he said, to live above with the saints we love. Oh, that'll be glory. But to live below with the saints we know. That's another story. So that's humility gives us a context to recognize how we should act towards others. Now, meekness. Now, meekness is a much maligned word. Um, it took me a long time to break the code, figure out what it meant uh, by meekness. Meekness is often translated gentleness. In our society, we think of meek as weak. We think of meekness as weakness. Not so, not biblical meekness. It takes an incredible amount of strength to bring to bear the character and the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ's character, to govern your own actions. To not do what you want to do, but do what Christ wants you to do. What the Spirit is leading you to do. And what you know you need to do. So, this is a longer quote. The word for... Um, for me, excuse me, for meekness is 
uh, Prautes, and it's spelled P-R-A-U-T-E-S, P-R-A-U-T-E-S, pronounced Prautes. Now, I'm going to read this, and what I'd like you to do is just shut out the world, the distractions, and listen to the sense of the control strength that is involved through the power of God, power of the Holy Spirit, to help us to have an attitude that is um, gentle and meek through strength, okay? So, proetes denotes the humble and gentle attitude which is, expresses itself in particular in a patient submissiveness to offense, free from malice and desire for revenge, controlled strength, the ability to bear reproaches and slights without bitterness and resentment, the ability to provide a soothing influence on someone who is in the state of anger, bitterness, or resentment against life. The word indicates an obedient submissiveness to God and His will with unwavering faith and enduring patience, displaying itself in a gentle attitude and kind acts towards others, and this often in the face of opposition. It is the restrained, and obedient powers of the personality brought to bear into subjection and into submission to God's will by the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.23. It's the opposite of arrogance. The word meekness stands in contrast to wrath and anger. It denotes the humble and gentle attitude which expresses itself <coughs> in particular in a patient submissiveness to offense, freedom from malice and desire for revenge, mildness, patient trust in the midst of difficult circumstances. And that was compiled from uh, the New Linguistic ex and Exegetical Key to the New Greek Testament, um, 1998, by C.L. Rogers. Uh, I love that. That word picture gives me a real sense of what it means to be gentle and meek. Not in a worldly sense, not a milquetoast person, but a person with spiritual power under control, exercising that power to please God and not man. Excellent, excellent view. Um, okay, biblical example. Um, the negative example is Paul to the church in 1 Corinthians 6. He speaks to them rather bluntly for their failure in dealing with the issues that arise among themselves and taking one another to court and suing each other before a secular court. And I'm going to start with verse 3. <clears throat> the whole passage is verses 1 through 11. I think I put 6 uh, through 7 in, in, in your uh, handout. So he starts out, Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed of the church. Now what he's saying is, the least of the people in the church are more qualified to judge as Christians than the secular judges that they're taking people to court with. Uh, verse 5, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? Verse 6, But brother goeth the law with brother, and before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? He is saying there, it is better to take the loss and to take the, the wrong than go to court and create another wrong. He says, you Christians are going to court and you're guilty of the same misconduct that the people you're going to court with uh, and that you're trying to rectify. So he says, verse 8, Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. 
Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous are going to be judging them in court. Be not deceived. And he goes on and he lists, Neither nor fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves, of mankind. And he goes on, None of those, verse 10, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He's saying, you're not forbearing with one another. You're taking each other to court. That is wrong. Judge among yourselves. Isn't there the least of your people are, should be able to do this? And find someone. Is there not a wise person among you? And judge. Let that person be the one to help settle the dispute. Okay, so that's the biblical example. Let's look at the principles here. And I've started making the principles, how should we then live? Based on what we've learned from the command and how we have analyzed it and we've looked at it and studied it, what is important for us to do? Okay, now, number one, we are to forbear one another, not grudgingly. You know how... You're, if you've had kids or been around kids and they say, the parent says, do this, they go, well, okay. You know, not that way, not grudgingly, or because it's expected, but willingly, because we're seeking the very best for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, number two, the Apostle Paul reminds us that love suffers long bears and endures all things. Uh, uh, often overlooked responsibility that we have for our love for one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and verse 7, verse 4 says, charity or love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. In verse 7, love beareth all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And that word beareth at the beginning of uh, verse 7 of chapter 13 is the word stego, S-T-E-G-O. And it means to literally protect by covering. It means to keep off something that threatens. And it means to literally, uh, that's what it means. So it means to bear up against, to endure, bear, or forbear beareth all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endureth all things. And that endure means to bear patiently, patiently. So the Apostle Paul reminds us that love suffers long and bears and endures all things. So number three, we must forbear our brother and sisters in Christ who display irritating speech, unusual habits, abrasive personality, eccentric mannerisms, and all those other things that we do to irritate one another. All of those things. Now, I worked with a guy that it was incredible. He was a young, tall, slender, attractive young man in his 30s, he had everything going for him, but when he opened his mouth, he said the wrong thing in the wrong way every time. He was always, I don't know if he was a different drummer, I don't know. But one day I was sitting next to him at a Christmas uh, lunch, and he looked, he's a, he was a Christian guy. He looked at me and he says, Scotty, I said something very gracious to him. He, he turned at me and he looked. He said, I always say the wrong thing. I said, I know. Why do you do that? Because <laughs> he did. If somebody would say something's really good, he would, out of whatever was in his brain, came out, I guess. And he didn't buffer it. And so it wasn't, it wasn't kind of sifted through. And, and he didn't say the gracious thing. And it was, it was, I wish I had a good example. It was horrible. But I think he got better because he got another job. He got some time in the Word and time in church, time with other Christian friends. And I believe that he grew out of that. But he would, and it wasn't mean things. He would just say the wrong thing. It just would like somebody bursting the balloon. And 
he had a personality quirk. And it kind of, I think he learned it when he was growing up, he said. And so we got to, we have to, the Lord wants us to forbear with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, number four, Paul and Barnabas had differences that caused them to minister separately. Uh, very often, complex conflicts are a result of differences that occur in ministry. Uh, and sometimes we get passionate about those. And there was not too many more passionate people than Paul. And Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, he was concerned about Mark, his, uh, uh, I think his uh, nephew, was his relative. And Mark had left one of the missionary journeys. And as a result, uh, Barnabas wound up taking Mark after that contention, uh, disagreement, and they sailed to Cyprus. And... Paul went on his way. And Acts 15, 39 says, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Now, Mark is the one that wrote the second gospel, the gospel of Mark. So there was eventual reconciliation. 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, the last half of the verse says, Paul says, to Timothy, bring Mark, he's in prison, <clears throat> Paul's in prison, bring Mark because he is profitable to me. A great compliment from Paul. So that was reconciled. Now, yes, but who was wrong? I don't know, probably both of them were wrong. But I, I thought about this. How sad to have this as an enduring legacy in the scripture for all time, that the, the contention was so sharp among them, they couldn't resolve it. The only way they could resolve it was to separate. We need not to be like that. And we need to uh, watch what we do and say to others, uh, regardless of the subject matter, uh, so that we are, conduct ourselves as if Christ was there and, and, and guiding us and using those character qualities of kindness, compassion, humility, meekness, and patience. So, <clears throat> um, they did reconcile. Okay, let's look at number five. We must forgive others as Christ forgave us when differences arise among Christians. We must not hold grudges or create division in the church. Colossians 3.13 the latter part of that passage said, uh, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. How much have we been forgiven? Oh my goodness. How much have we been forgiven? And above all these things, put on love, which is a bond of uh, completeness. So I want to read another Spurgeon quote. This is one of the more colorful Spurgeon quotes I've come across. <laughs> Listen carefully. He says, Hear this, beloved, I pray you, especially those of you who have hot tempers and have fallen out with one another. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Remember how much Christ has forgiven you and show a forgiving, or rather forbearing and forgiving spirit to others. I think that is so funny that he put that little phrase in there. Especially those of you who have hot tempers. Some of us have hot tempers that we haven't worked, that we haven't mastered yet. And we need to remember that. And even those of us who don't, that those of us that do slow burns, we need to remember how much Christ has forgiven us. And we need to show a forbearing and forgiving spirit to one another. Now, I think it important, number six, to remember we must not misinterpret the words, speech, or conduct of other believers. There are many possible explanations in those ambiguous and unclear situations. And some, it is, it, it's, it's impossible to attribute motives to others. That is to say, oh, that person did this because of this. We don't know that. We can't see the inside of people. We cannot understand completely what might have been said or done. 
we must forbear others in doubtful circumstances, especially in cross-cultural environments where language and culture is a barrier to our understanding. Text and emails, uh, I found, are especially susceptible <laughs> to misinterpretations. Um, I have received at work, when I worked, an email that said, dot, 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 dot. And I thought, well, that means this. And I talked to them later on, and I said, okay, I did what you asked me to do. I did that, that. They said, that's not what I said. And I read it to them. They said, no, but that means this. And I go, and I look at it a minute, and I go, yeah, it could mean that. But because of my experience and background, I thought it meant this. Exact opposite of what they said. So we must be careful uh, when we are using something then other than face-to-face -face communication. Even audio communication is difficult. Telephone communication, text, written communication is susceptible to misinterpretation. At my next to the last job that I had before I retired, um, I was called on as a manager, a business unit manager, I was called upon to be over as many as 475 people and I was called to interpret their actions as either wrong or right according to the rules of the company. Either guilty or not guilty in other words. I was called to be a judge and I found very quickly that I need to be in, I needed to be very incredibly careful because sometimes I would have an idea and all the evidence would indicate this happened. And looking at the story after, I was always careful to go and talk to the person directly and hear what they had to say. I would have them come in with their union rep or whoever they wanted to represent them and they would say, well, this is what actually happened. And they would maybe provide me written documentation or other proof of what happened. And I would go, oh, that's certainly different from what it appeared to be. And in many cases, they weren't even guilty. So I learned carefully to be careful about what I said and did and make sure I talked to the person to find out what actually occurred. And we need to be careful in those ambiguous situations that are kind of doubtful. Something might have been said, something might have happened. We need to take everything with a grain of salt, so to speak. Number seven. We must, however, address sin. I'm not saying that we need to forbear sin. We're not to forbear sin, okay? When it's clear, it's obvious, and detrimental to the church's life, there's been an action which is sinful, and it affects the church's life and witness and testimony. For those public sins, the church leadership should be involved. For individual sins, we need to follow the steps of church discipline seeking restoration. And it's beyond the scope of what we have time to do for today um, to look at that, but you can look at Matthew 18 and those verses. So what is the importance of forbearing one another? Well, forbearing one another, reading from page three in the handout, forbearing one another is commanded by God and the Lord tells us that he equates, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, if we love him, we will obey him. He equates obedience with loving him. So we must obey his commands and if we love him and each other. This command is valuable because the Holy Spirit uses it to preserve the unity and peace and love of the church. Criticisms, anger, disharmony, disagreements and judgments involving each other will develop without us forbearing one another. And they can eventually and will eventually destroy the loving fellowship and the local church. Christians are to put on kindness, compassion, humility, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another and forgiving one another as Christ forgave us. This promotes love and unity and a powerful testimony to the world. God blesses us when, when we engage in love and unity. We're unified. 
And he blesses us when we obey his commands. So God blesses love and unity and our obedience to scriptural commands. So my prayer is that may we be a church, may we be a community full of Christ-like Christians who lovingly put on and wear kindness, compassion, humility, meekness, and patience to forbear and to forgive each other for the glory and praise of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. May that be this church. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of looking at forbearing and forgiving one another. We pray, Father, that you would help us to forbear each other, that we might be like Christ, that we might take on um, all those kindness, compassion, humility, meekness, and patience. We pray, Father, that you would be with each one, bless each family here represented in our Sunday school and those that are watching from home. We pray for the sick, those that are disabled and hurting. We pray for your healing in their lives. We pray for the spiritual healing in our lives as well. Give us a good day as we honor you and our service to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.